Hello, and welcome to video V1 of my Lattice Basis Reduction course. In this lecture, I'll introduce the mathematics of lattices. Much of this material is duplicated from video V4 of my Mathematics of Lattice Space Cryptography course. I've included it here as well to make this course more self-contained. We'll begin with the definition of a lattice and then take a look at some examples. Then I'll discuss lattice bases and introduce the notions of volume and successive minima. Finally, I'll present the Gaussian heuristic, which provides an estimate for the length of a shortest non-zero vector in a lattice. Let me remind you that you can find links to all the videos and slides on our webpage, cryptography101.ca. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can be notified when we post a new video. A lattice L in n-dimensional real space Rn is the set of all integer linear combinations of m linearly independent vectors b1, b2, up to bm in Rn. Here, m is less than or equal to n. The set b is called a basis of L, and we write L equals L of b. The dimension of L is n, and the rank of L is m. From now on, we'll assume that the basis vectors b1, b2, up to bm have integer coordinates. In this case, the lattice L is comprised of all vectors x1, b1, plus x2, b2, plus xm, bm, where the coefficients xi are integers. All components of every lattice vector are integers. And so L is a subset of zn, and is called an integer lattice. If we let B denote the n by m matrix, whose columns are the basis vectors, then the lattice can be expressed compactly as comprising of all length n vectors bx, as x ranges over all length m integer vectors x. This is the set of all integer linear combinations of the columns of B. A lattice L primed is called a sublattice of L if L primed is a subset of L. A full rank lattice L in Rn is a lattice of rank n. Unless otherwise stated, we will assume that all lattices and sublattices are full rank and integer. Note that if B is a basis for a full rank lattice in Rn, then it is also a basis for the vector space Rn. The key distinction lies in the type of linear combinations. As a lattice basis, the set of all integer linear combinations of the basis vectors produces all the lattice elements. On the other hand, as a vector space basis, the set of all real linear combinations of the basis vectors generates the entire space Rn. Here's an example of a simple two-dimensional lattice L1 with basis vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1 which we recognize as the standard unit vectors. The elements of L1 are all integer linear combinations of these unit vectors. In other words, L1 is a set of all integer coordinate points in the plane. The fundamental parallelopiped associated with the basis B1 is a set of all linear combinations of the basis vectors where the scalars A1 and A2 are real numbers between 0 and 1 but not including 1. Geometrically, this region is the green square shown in the figure. More generally, let L be an n-dimensional lattice with basis B. The fundamental parallelopiped associated with B is a set of all linear combinations of the basis vectors where the scalars a1, a2 up to an are real numbers between 0 and 1, but not including 1. As we saw in the previous example, the fundamental parallelopiped can be used to partition Rn into non-overlapping regions called parallelopipeds. The corners of these parallelopipeds are the elements of the lattice Lb. In other words, by placing a copy of the fundamental parallelopiped at each lattice point, we get a tiling of the entire space. Here is a second example of a two-dimensional lattice L2 with basis vectors 2, 0, and 0, 1. 
The fundamental parallel pipe of L2 is the green rectangle shown in the figure. Repeating the shape at each lattice point produces a tiling of the plane where the corners are the elements of L2. Observe that L2 is a sublattice of the lattice L1 from the previous example. However, it's clear from the figure that L2 is not equal to L1. This can be verified algebraically by showing that a lattice point in L1 is not in L2. For example, consider the point 1, 0, which belongs to L1. We can write this vector as a linear combination of the basis vectors for L2. However, one of the coefficients of this linear combination is not an integer, and this proves that 1, 0 is not in L2. Here is a third example of a two-dimensional lattice L3 with basis vectors minus 2, minus 2, and 4, 3. It turns out that L2, the lattice from the previous example, is a sublattice of L3. This can be verified by expressing each vector in the basis B2 for L2 as an integer linear combination of the basis vectors in B3. Conversely, L3 is a sublattice of L2, since each vector in the basis B3 for L3 can be expressed as an integer linear combination of the basis vectors in B2. Because each lattice is contained in the other, we conclude that the lattices L2 and L3 are equal. Thus, B2 and B3 are different bases for the same lattice. The basis B2 is nicer than the basis B3, since its vectors are shorter and orthogonal to each other. By a short vector, I mean one with small Euclidean length, that is, small L2 norm. Here is a fourth example of a two-dimensional lattice L4 with basis vectors 2, 0, and 1, 1. The fundamental parallel pipette of L4 is the green parallelogram shown in the figure. Repeating the shape at each lattice point yields a tiling of the plane whose corners are the elements of L4. As an exercise, show that L4 is not equal to L1, nor is it equal to L2. As another exercise, show that 1 minus 1 and 1, 1 is a second basis for L4. This basis is nicer than the basis B4, since its vectors are shorter and orthogonal. Given an ordered basis B for a lattice L, one can get new ordered bases for L by repeatedly performing the following operations. Swap two basis vectors. Multiply a basis vector by minus 1. Add an integer multiple of one basis vector to another basis vector. These operations demonstrate that a lattice has infinitely many bases. As we've seen, a lattice can have more than one basis. In fact, a lattice has infinitely many bases. Some bases are nicer than others. And this distinction is one reason why lattices are useful in public key cryptography. A bad basis for a lattice can serve as a public key, whereas a good basis can serve as the corresponding private key. The security comes from the hope that recovering the good basis from the bad one is a computationally difficult problem. Now, let's characterize the bases of a lattice. Let L be an n-dimensional lattice with basis matrix B1. Then another n by n integer matrix B2 is also a basis matrix for L if and only if B1 equals B2 times U for some unimodular matrix U. A unimodular matrix is a square integer matrix whose determinant is plus or minus 1. For example, we saw earlier that B2 and B3 are both basis matrices for the same lattice. Indeed, B2 can be written as B3 times the unimodular matrix U. I'll leave the proof of this theorem to you as an exercise. The volume of a lattice is defined as the absolute value of the determinant of its basis matrix. In fact, the volume of a lattice equals the volume of its fundamental parallel pipette, 
where volume generalizes the usual notion of area of a two-dimensional parallelogram. Using the characterization of lattice bases, one can show that the volume is an invariant of a lattice. It does not depend on the choice of basis. Moreover, if L1 is a sublattice of L2, then the volume of L1 is at least as large as the volume of L2. A fundamental problem in lattice space cryptanalysis is finding a good basis for a lattice. A useful concept for determining the quality of a lattice basis is a successive minima. Let L be an n dimensional lattice. For each i between 1 and n, the ith successive minimum of L, denoted lambda i of L, is the smallest real number r such that L contains i linearly independent vectors, the longest of which has length r. Here, the linear independence is over the real numbers. Note that the successive minima form a non decreasing sequence of real numbers. The first successive minimum lambda 1 is the length of a shortest non zero lattice vector. I emphasize a shortest vector rather than the because a lattice has more than one shortest non zero vector. Indeed, if v is a shortest non zero lattice vector, then so is minus v. A classical result of Minkowski states that the length of a shortest non-zero vector in a lattice is at most the square root of n times the nth root of the lattice volume. This gives an upper bound on the length of a shortest non-zero lattice vector. However, determining this length is a difficult problem, let alone the problem of actually finding a lattice vector of that length. The Gaussian heuristic refines this estimate, suggesting that in a random n-dimensional lattice, the shortest non-zero vectors are likely to be slightly shorter than the upper bound provided by Minkowski's theorem. As I mentioned earlier, some lattice bases are nicer than others. For instance, consider the shortest vector problem. Consider two instances of SVP with bases B2 and B3. We saw earlier that B2 and B3 are bases for the same lattice. When we use B2, it's immediately clear that 0, 1 is a shortest non-zero vector in the lattice. On the other hand, if the lattice is presented with basis B3, then determining a shortest non-zero vector in the lattice would require more work. The key point is that having a good basis for a lattice can make certain lattice problems easier to solve. I mentioned in the previous video that the shortest vector problem SVP is a fundamental lattice problem. SVP is believed to be very hard. Indeed, it has been proven to be NP-hard, which provides strong evidence of its difficulty, at least in the worst case. The fastest algorithm known for SVP runs in time 2 to the power 0.292n, which is exponential in the lattice dimension n. The fastest quantum algorithm known for SVP is slightly faster, with the running time 2 to the power 0.265n, also exponential in the lattice dimension n. The NP hardness of SVP along with its apparent resistance to quantum attacks, makes it a useful foundation for designing quantum-safe cryptosystems. A natural relaxation of SVP is approximate SVP, denoted SVP gamma, where the goal is to find a lattice vector whose length is within a factor gamma of the length of a shortest non-zero vector. Note that SVP gamma with approximation factor gamma equals 1 is just SVP. SVP gamma is believed to be hard for small gamma. Indeed, it's been proven to be NP hard for constant gamma. However, it likely isn't NP hard if gamma is greater than the square root of n. For approximation factor gamma equals 2 to the k, the fastest algorithm known for SVP gamma runs in time exponential in n divided by k. Lastly, I'll note that if gamma is very large, 
then SVP gamma can be efficiently solved by using the LLL algorithm. Compute a relatively short lattice basis and then take the shortest basis vector. I'll conclude with some remarks on low rank lattices. Let L be an n dimensional integer lattice of rank m, with basis b1, b2 up to bm. Here, m is at most equal to n. The volume of L is defined to be the square root of the determinant of the product of b and its transpose. Note that since b is an n by m matrix, b times b transpose is an n by n square matrix. So the determinant of b times b transpose is well defined. Observe that this definition of volume generalizes the definition given earlier for full rank lattices. Indeed, when m equals n, so L is a full rank lattice, its volume is the square root of the determinant of b times b transpose, which can be written like this. Or like this, since b transpose and b have the same determinant. Thus, the volume of L is the absolute value of the determinant of b, recovering the formula given earlier. In fact, SVP can be solved efficiently in two-dimensional lattices using Gauss's algorithm, which we'll present in the next video. However, the problem becomes much harder as the lattice dimension increases.